Hi, with all the recent to do about clocks, I thought I'd show you how to design and build your own do-it-yourself clock using this example that I built myself back when I was a teenager back in the 1980s. So I thought we'd uh, take it apart, uh, hopefully reverse engineer it a bit because unfortunately I've lost the schematics for this. I did originally, well I've lost it twice actually, my original hand-drawn uh, you know, scrap notes that I originally uh, designed this thing from. I lost that and then I redrew it, I don't know, 15 years ago or something and I've lost that one as well. So it won't be an accurate reverse engineering as you'll see inside why, but hey, I thought we'd have a look at it. And this uh, clock sat on my shelf for a long, long time and uh, it's got features where you can uh, accelerate it like that to actually set the time and you can actually get different speeds for that. Look at that. Beautiful. And it's got AM, PM indication and fantastically one tenth of a second. If you're going to design your own clock, I highly recommend you add one tenth of a second. Add some excitement to it. Beauty. Let's take a look inside. And here it is. Please excuse the crudity of the model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Check out this classic Vero board rat's nest construction. Wow. I made this with uh, basically junk bin uh, parts at the time. I think I only had to uh, go to the local Tricky Dicks store or wherever I went to to um, just get a couple of uh, parts for the thing. So mostly like, um, you know, used and salvaged parts from other either other projects or from uh, stuff that I'd torn down. And of course, back in the 1980s, there were no microcontrollers that you take uh, for granted these days. So this is all done with, uh, as you'll see, uh, discrete uh, TTL type chips. I use the t term TTL generically. Um, these aren't actually uh, 7400 uh, series TTL. They're actually uh, 4000 series CMOS. I'm pretty sure all of them are actually 4000 series uh, CMOS. So let's take a look. But, ah, oh, geez, look at this. This is, this is really embarrassing, isn't it? But hey, you know, this is what you do because not only didn't you have microcontrollers back in the day, so you designed everything using discrete logic and maybe there's a couple of couple of trannies down in there as well, a couple of transistors, and uh, and you build it on breadboard because, yes, I did make my own uh, PCBs back in the day, but I, I can't remember. I probably just couldn't be bothered for this one. Um, so, you know, I just sort of, you know, hacked it together on a weekend just using some VeraBoard or point-to-point -point wiring and this uh, front panel it's just got a red uh, filter which actually helps a lot I can show you that with and without that and the display uh, panel just uh, pops off here and I've got uh, there's the AMP indicator that's obviously a different type to these other ones I think I may have got uh, spurred on to uh, build this because I may have actually got these uh, from somewhere. I don't think these were, sal I'm not sure if they were salvaged, this one might be, but um, yeah, these old ones, I think I got them and I went, oh, what can I do with them? I oh, know, I'll make a clock. Um, so yeah, that's what I did. And I added some three millimetre LEDs in there. They're just always on to give you a traditional uh, colon look that separates your hours from your minutes and your uh, seconds. And obviously I did a bit of tweaking of the uh, lead dropper resistors. Look at this, all just point to point coming out like that. This one over here needed its own thing. And anyway, we'll um, hopefully be able to uh, reverse engineer that. Um, the case I I probably uh, salvaged from another uh, project. I believe some of the chips in here, the 4026s, um, as we'll uh, see, I got those from an old frequency counter. I would continually actually uh, reuse parts from old projects. In fact, um, if we have a look at some of the date codes of the chips in here, I did actually salvage some of the chips out of this clock um, to build another, uh, to build other projects at the time, but I eventually uh, replaced them. So we'll probably, if we have a look at the date codes, we might find some like, you know, 1980s um, labeled chips, perhaps even 1970s maybe, where I, um, you know, desoldered them out of uh, products and things like that. But anyway, and probably replaced with some modern, uh, you know, ones that might have been manufactured in the 90s perhaps. So I did get it uh, going again at one point, but yeah, <laughs> look at the rat's nest construction. Crikey. <laughs> oh.
and those old timers in Australia will have fond memories of Ferguson Transformers. Are they still around? I don't know what happened to Ferguson. Anyway, very famous uh, manufacturer, Australian manufacturer of uh, Transformers. And as you might be able to tell, this one was like salvaged out of uh, some bit of gear. I uh, tore down and salvaged parts because we didn't have the mail order stuff. We didn't have the digi keys and the mouses and everything that you take advantage for these days. Yeah, we had our local Tricky Dick store here, Dick Smith Electronics, or the local Tandy store if you wanted to buy, you know, two resistors in a packet for, you know, a couple of bucks. Um, then you could do that. But, you know, it was it was really worthwhile back in the day to salvage um, parts from, uh, from products that you actually tore down. So this uh, fuse holder here would have... Uh, come from something else. Even the mains cord would have uh, come from something else. You can see I've just got a bit of uh, strain relief just tying it in there. It's a bit how you're doing, a bit of electrical tape over there, but you know. Um, like, and the heat sink I would have got uh, from something else. As you can see, it's got some weird pin out in there for, you know, some uh, package that it was used from. So I just bent that over there to sort of fit under these uh, switches. Now, based on my very vague recollection, I reckon that date's probably accurate, uh, uh, 1987, because I think I have this vague memory that I actually went out and bought a couple of parts for this thing, including the uh, 7805 5 volt regulator here. So that one, yeah, it probably dates this clock to about late 87. You can see one of the replace chips in here, CD4026. I was very fond of uh, 4026s back in the day, as you'll see, very handy little uh, versatile chip used them in frequency counters and and clocks like this and all sorts of stuff um that one's got a date code of uh, 1999 so yeah that was um one of the chips i salvaged out and would have uh, replaced at a later date in fact that's probably when i redrew the schematic i'd be guessing because i did i'm pretty sure i redrew an accurate schematic and bug it if i can find it though i went to a lot of effort to do that damn I think I might have even scanned it in as well on one of the very early scanners, but oh, bug it if I can find it. And there's a very sorry looking uh, 4013. Is that, I, is that 82? I don't know. And like, so yeah, I'm not quite sure of the date code, but I think that one's actually got some solder on some of the pins down in there, so that would have been a um, a desoldered chip that I desoldered, right, probably, yeah, in the early 80s, so I reused that one. Actually, here's a whole bunch of 4000 series chips from my original stockpile back when I was a kid, and uh, yeah, you can see, look, there's a, there's a 4013, 1984 vintage, uh, you know, probably put some more recent ones in there from 92, so I may have got those from Oh, who knows, may have got those surplus parts from a company I used to work at back in the early 90s. Perhaps there's a, there's a sad looking site. Oh yeah, Toshiba part, look at that, desoldered. <laughs> Still work today, absolutely no doubt. And of course you'd go to that effort because like something like a 40161 wasn't actually one of the more common chips that you typically find at your store. So you'd be tearing down a product and you'd go, oh, oh 40161, geez, don't have one of those in my stock. So you'd quickly desolder that and uh, whack it in your junk bin. Wow, I think I found my earliest two. Get the dust off those. Look at that. 4512 from 1975. 1977 to 4011. Oh, terrific stuff. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help but going down memory lane here. Check out some of the dates, 80, 82, 87, 81, 84. You know, I, <laughs> it was a different world back then. You had to do this to get a decent um, stockpile of parts that you could just, uh, you know, lash up new designs with. So there's a 30 plus year old parts bin. Oh, I haven't had the heart to throw it out. I didn't show the resistors on the side there. They're obviously the dropper resistors for uh, uh, most of the uh, seven-segment displays at the front here. Just use that uh, 0.1-inch uh, pin headers on the side here just as a convenient point to uh, solder the wires after I did the main board. So I've got a combination of uh, green wire wrap wire in there to just do main and main circuitry, but all the off-board uh, stuff, it was easier just to put in 0.1-inch headers instead of uh, trying to insert um, individual wires and have them coming out.
And some of this is really messed up. But give me a break. You know, I was only a teenager at the time. Look at my, I got my AC input here. I got Diabridge. I have to tap that off, as you'll see, to uh, uh, get the 50 hertz uh, mains reference. Because this is not a crystal controlled uh, clock. It uses the 50 hertz mains, which is incredibly stable over the long term. Anyway, um, yeah, so yeah, we've got some transistors in there doing something. Got a big bypass cap, and oh, don't ask me what's going on there. I obviously bodged something in because I was making this up as I went along. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. And I'll show you the difference that uh, red filter makes. We'll whack it in, whack it in there. Look at that. That makes a big difference. And you'll notice this segment here is all out of whack. Um, that was just like a power up. Uh, glitch, you know, I obviously didn't get the uh, reset correct on that. Here we go. It'll come good. There we go. <laughs> it came good. So that wasn't really a problem. That was just a quirk. You know, I didn't put, you know, decent, um, like, RC power-up uh, reset on there and things like that. So it didn't matter. Once you actually set the thing, then it worked just fine. And no, there was no battery backup on this thing. If the uh, mains failed, then this thing failed. But I had it going for years. We had a very stable mains. And ta-da! Here it is. A hopefully uh, semi-reverse engineered schematic for this thing is not complete i haven't gone in and looked at individual you know pin numbers and put all that sort of stuff on here but i think i've got the original functionality of this thing in sort of like a block uh chip form so you know if you wanted to build your own from this you could certainly do it all you'd need to do is look up the uh, pin numbers and whatnot so hopefully i've got it right now I know this looks messy and stick with me, hopefully it'll um, come together at the end. So what we've got here are our eight, seven segment uh, displays like this. They're all uh, common cathode type, which means that they uh, go down to ground, all the cathodes are connected together, and a one on the output of the chip will actually turn the LED on. Um, a common anode is probably uh, more common, but I had common cathode at the time, and it works with the chip that I loved and used a lot back when I was a kid, the 4026. So anyway, we've got the um, eight digits here. We've got our tens of seconds display here. We've got our uh, seconds display here. This decimal point is permanently turned on there. So we'd just have an individual uh, dropper resistor in there just tied to the rail to turn that on permanently. Uh, we've got our colon display in here. Once again, it'll just have uh, two diodes in series with a dropper resistor. We've got minutes, another colon display permanently on. And then we've got our tricky, which we'll go into, um, 12 display. And of course, this one over here, it only has to count up to 12. So while this one can go from zero to 10, this one only has to basically Basically, do a one or an off as you hear because we don't actually display the zero so it's either, it either shows a one or it doesn't show or it just switches off and then we've got an AMPM indicator here and I really didn't uh, reverse engineer that's just a 4013 um, flip-flop that's it to actually uh, do that and by the way AMP it's always displaying P here so basically the C segment that bottom one there is just uh, toggles off and on basically that's pretty much all it is and if you're not familiar with um, seven segment display annotation they're always uh, labeled like this so a b c d e f and the middle one there is g that's just a common industry notation Okay, so what we've got here is two 40 volt mains in just that uh, isolation transformer I don't even know what voltage it is what is it uh, I don't know nine volts or something i'm not sure anyway it doesn't matter um then we've got just a half wave uh rectify here and a uh, filter cap and a 7805 to power this whole thing now i didn't actually need the 7805 because the um cmos chips i'm using can actually go up to even well the 4020 4026s can go up to 20 volts um so i didn't really need the 7805 i think i just did that it was just a nicety to you know have a known fixed level uh to work from the no mains variation changes the uh brightness and all that sort of jazz so strictly speaking not needed and what we do here is we tap off before the halfway rectifier here tap off the ac and uh what we do is just uh, diode clamp that uh down here so it doesn't go negative and then that will actually produce a 50 hertz um, pulse into here you've got a, a resistor divider here and then we can get our 50 hertz clock 
coming from our mains into this chip. Let's have a look at that on the scope. And there it is. If we probe pin 10 of our 4040 uh, ripple counter here, then we can see that the 50 hertz. There it is. Um, well, it says 49 on here, but uh, yeah, tr well, uh, 50. There we go. Oh, look at that. I <laughs> noticed on the signal in here, displaying all those decimal places, but uh, looks like we don't have the resolution. So that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a fail. It's giving you a false sense of precision there. Anyway, that's bang on 50 hertz regulated by um, the generators at the uh, local power station. No problems at all. So very accurate long-term 50 hertz. Anyway, here's our uh, ground level here. So that's been diode clamped negative there to 0.6 because you don't want to damage the chip. And on the uh, top side here, I've actually, I must be uh, clamping it. Uh, positive because it's just going um, just over the uh, rail there as well. Or maybe I chose my resistors to do that. No, I think I'm uh, clipping there. So there you go. We've got a good enough uh, 50 hertz input to our 4040 ripple counter. So this 4040 binary ripple counter here, it just uh, counts up in binary. It's got, a, I don't know, what is it got, eight outputs or whatever. And um, we're tapping off the uh, Q1 and the Q3 out because what we want to do is divide that 50 hertz by five to give us 10 hertz because remember, we've got our tenth of a second display. So you want that to turn over 10 times per second, 10 hertz. So you want to uh, decode that on when it switches to six. So zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero. And when it gets to six, boom, reset the thing here. Now I've noted that um, it should be that easy. And then we can just feed the output of that into our following stage. But I note that I've actually got a couple of transistors and some uh, caps and things down in here. So something's going on in there. I haven't reverse engineered it. Sorry, it couldn't be bothered. Um, it's not terribly easy without looking at the bottom. Um, anyway, so I'm obviously doing some sort of um, RC uh, transistor pulse stretching or something like that, just to give a bit of a cleaner clock to the next stage. So here's where the magic of the 4026 chip comes in. I love these puppies. As I said, I've used them for everything. And uh, what they are is a decade counter uh, divider. So they've basically got a combination of a, um, a BCD a decade counter uh, plus a decoded uh, seven segment output display driver. So, you know, traditionally to do this, you need like uh, two chips to do it. You need uh, one for the BCD counter and then you need a BCD to seven segment uh, decoder. But this one's got them both built in. So it's a single chip solution for a uh, decade type counting display. So very useful for frequency counters and uh, things like that. And if you want to count from zero to nine and display it on seven segment LED, this is your man right here. There's the internal circuitry for those uh, playing along at home. So it's got a buffered output. And I recall these things, you uh, didn't really have to uh, add dropper resistors on the output. They would drive LED displays direct. And it wasn't too much of a uh, drama. If we had a look down here, you know, maximum or typical uh, output high. Uh, source current because that's what we're doing. We're sourcing because we've got a common uh, cathode display here. So we're and a one that turns the lead on. Um, you know, look, we're looking at you know a, a couple of milliamps, but I I do believe I added like a single dropper resistor over here. I think just to dim the display a bit. I think it was actually uh, too bright, and I didn't want the thing glaring all the time. I didn't add an auto brightness adjustment for at night time. So I pretty much sort of you know experimented with the resistor value in there just to do that. I didn't put seven uh, resistors in here. I did for the four five one one. Uh, which we'll take a look at uh, later, but it, it, it had a different uh, output drive and yeah So but for the 4026, I think I got away with just the one resistor in the common cathode uh, Line here experimenting with that until I got the brightness I wanted so at this point It's far too easy. This one ticks over 0 to 9 uh, 10 times uh, per second and then it's got to carry out um, output pin, which of course is designed to go into the clock of the next one. So these chips are designed to be cascaded like this. And there's a companion chip to this, the uh, 4033, which has ripple blanking and all sorts of other things if you uh, want to get fancy pantsy, but we didn't need that. So um, just, yeah, carry straight into the clock input. The next one counts up zero to nine. Not a problem whatsoever. 
But what we want is for this um, seconds display here to, to count from zero to five and then reset. Well, how do we do it? Well, we do it exactly the same as we uh, did down here with this uh, diode AND gate here. We anded these two together and fed it back to the reset. We do essentially exactly the same thing here. We tap off the digits we want to signify that we've reached the digit six. And when we get to the digit six, we want to uh, diode AND gate that here, so the, this is just, just your standard diode AND gate, we should pull up resistor here, and we can ordinarily, imagine that's not there, we could ordinarily feed that straight into our positive reset pin here. But, eh, there's a reason why we need these transistors. And that reason is because the 4026 is a seven segment display driver, there is no BCD output, no logic level output that we can actually tap off and feed back in because this uh, reset pin is a logic input pin. It needs whatever threshold is required for this particular CMOS logic and your supply voltage. And remember, the output of this seven segment display here is driving this LED. So it's not going to be five volts. It's not going to be outputting five volts here. It's actually going to be limited to uh, in, internally to whatever, to the diode drop here down to ground. So the drop across the resistor here plus the drop across the LED here, uh, red LED, you know, 1.8 volts, say, typical. Then you might have a bit extra drop. Say it's two volts. You'll get like two volts on this pin here. That two volts is not enough to actually reset this thing here. Well, actually, that's not strictly true. Um, what it is, is it's not enough to actually pull these diodes back to the positive rail up here like this. So with, with this uh, pull-up resistor, and of course, you know, we could put this to like two volts or whatever, and our AND gate would work, but then we wouldn't have the threshold level required here. So essentially, it's a combination problem of not being able to operate this diode AND gate here. Hence why we have to add this uh, two, transi well, two transistor inverters here, so it's a buffer. So effectively we're buffering this thing here. And if we probe one of those LED outputs, there you go, you can see that it's been uh, clamped at about uh, 2 volts there. So that's the uh, LED uh, drop voltage plus the any drop on any series resistor. Now, unlike down here, where we actually had the binary output here to decode, we don't actually have the binary output to decode here, it's all internal to the chip. There's an internal BCD counter, but we don't have access to it. We only have access to the seven segment decoded outputs. But thankfully, if you look at how a number six is constructed on here with like that, and B is the only one that's not on, then uh, you can work out, if you look at all the numbers, uh, zero, one, two, three, and just visualize all those um, segments coming on for each digit. When you get to the number six, there are three segments, uh, segment E, F, and G, and those ones are uniquely all lit up when we have the number six. So we're able to tap off segments E, F, and G like this, and the other four just go uh, straight through. Well, they all go straight through, but we tap off E, F, and G. So we want an AND gate, hence the diode AND gate. When all three of those segments are lit up, we must have the number six. And bingo, when that happens, uh, none of these diodes are pulled low. They're all pulled high. So therefore, our resistor is going to pull the base of this transistor high, and bingo, it's going to pull, turn this transistor on and pull this low here, and this low here will actually uh, turn off this transistor, which will then, pull, due to this pull-up resistor here, pull the reset pin high. Bingo. So as you can see, it just works as one big buffered AND gate. A 1, a 1, and a 1 gives us a 1 on the output. If, there's a, if it's 1, 1, 0, meh, we're going to get 0 on the output. But those who are keen-eyed might go, Dave, there's something not quite right with this circuit, and pause the video here and figure out if you can find the fault. If you want a little fault-finding exercise, there's something wrong here. This, as it's drawn, is not going to work. So pause the video now, and I'll tell you after the break. All right, did you figure it out? Well, I hope you did. If not, here's the explanation. Okay, when the output of all these is zero, okay, this is going to be zero, Let's say, well, it doesn't matter. Even one of the diodes going zero, okay, uh, is going to, due to this pull-up resistor, there's going to be 0 0.6 volts across that diode, right? So we've now got 0 0.6 volts at the base 
of our NPN transistor here. What? 0.6 volts diode in there is it basically exactly the same drop as the base uh, emitter junction inside this transistor. So effectively, this transistor is going to turn on. It's not going to turn on super hard, but it's going to turn on. So basically, if you just had this arrangement as it's shown, this transistor would always be turned on, regardless of the inputs here. So how do you fix that? Well, it's simple. You just add another diode in there like that, and bingo, with basically zeros on the input here, or even one zero, then we've now got two diode drops to overcome, so therefore, this transistor is going to do its business. So that's actually the true circuit right there. So that was easy peasy. We now have a display which counts up to basically 59.9 seconds and then resets and just repeats that over and over again. And once again, the carry output of our 4026 goes into our next minutes display now. So every minute we'll get a pulse out of this carry and it will uh, turn over this uh, first digit on the minutes display here. Once again, that counts zero to nine, no problems whatsoever. But we've got the same issue we had here with the five nine, because there's only 59 minutes or 60 minutes in an hour. So we've got exactly the same um, six decoder reset circuit, I've called it here. Exactly the same thing happening here, easy. And you might be wondering how I got the uh, speed up display on those digits. Well, I've got two switches on the back, one here and one here. And what I'm doing is just on the seconds here, I'm just basically optionally switching in uh, that 10 hertz signal. So I can increment the seconds at 10 times uh, per second. I can also uh, increment the tens of minutes uh, as well. But it had a neat little thing, whereas if you put the switch right in the middle, okay, it was break before make. So essentially the input to this CMOS chip was floating here, the clock input. And if you know anything about CMOS, uh, 4000 series CMOS, they are essentially infinite input impedance. So any noise at all being picked up on that line, especially the big long antenna line, there you go, going to the back, switch here, this big long line going over with the 50 hertz running everywhere, right? It'd easily pick up the 50 hertz on there. So if you actually just sat these switches that are used on the back, you could actually just sit them in the middle and leave them there. You could either hold them there or they'd sort of stay there on their own. So instead of 10 times per second, we get 50 times per second here or here. So that'd be like, so it had a slow set and a fast set as well. Awesome little feature. And I can show you that uh, dual speed thing here, like it's going normal, then it's going at 10 times per second. And if I put it in the middle, as you can see, 50 hertz, because that pin is floating. But if I actually go in and uh, probe the clock pin, so even though we've got effective 10 meg input resistance of our probe, you'll note that, bingo, no, that just went down like that. And you'll notice that it's not incrementing there at all, because, well, there's nothing going through. We're just pulling that clock pin low. So that's the great thing about 4000 series uh, CMOS using these. Effective, they're so ultra, you can build really great ultra low power designs with them because there are uh, effectively infinite input impedance like that. And uh, you can, uh, like the pull-ups, you can use like 10 meg pull-up resistors so you're not pissing away any current at all. 10 meg works just fine on a 4000 series CMOS. Although it's not a hard pull up so if you had a long line but as you can see I got this long line in here and it, you know 10 meg it was it wasn't picking up anything but yeah you got to be careful but hold on to your hats folks this is where it gets nasty and this is where it actually took me um quite some time to figure out what was going on again after all these years and well I think I've got it right anyway I hope I have so well, what we've got here, okay, we can count up, this is, you know, this is circuits pretty easy, right? We can count up to 60 and then reset, no problems at all. But the hours is really weird. It's got to count up to 12, and well, that doesn't sound too hard, but the 12 is split over two digits. So this uh, hours, the first hours digit here, actually has a convoluted 
um, sequence, okay? This is what it looks like. It has to count like this. Just ignore that there. It's got to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. Okay, that's fine. We can do that. Okay, it could have done that with our 4026. No problems at all. And then it resets back to zero. No problems, right? Exactly the same as what we've seen before. And then it starts counting up again. You think, what's the problem? Well, it's got to go 9, 0, 1, 2, and then back to 1 like this. Not to 0, but back to 1. So that's what that digit has to do. It's got that convoluted sequence. It's got like 1, 2, and then 1, 2 again. So how the hell do you do that? Well, you can't do it with your uh, 4026 because you don't have access to the internal BCD output, as I mentioned before. So what I did is it did it the more traditional way and used a 4518, which is basically the same as the first half of the 4026. It's a, just a BCD counter. That's it. And there's the four outputs there. It counts from zero to nine. Exactly, uh, you know, exactly like the 4026 here. But uh, then, of course, we need to drive our seven segment display. So we've got a 4511, which is a BCD to seven segment display driver. No problems at all. This is sort of like your traditional method of uh, driving seven segment displays. If you don't have, like in TTL, uh, for example, there's equivalent ones. I don't think the TTL 7400 series has an equivalent to the 4026. That's from rusty memory. I stand to be corrected on that. But to get that weird count, we have to have all this convoluted circuitry here, and you're going to have to stick with me on this one. It will work out in the end. Okay, just forget that all of this is here for a minute, okay? And we've got basically the equivalent to our 4026 here, okay? Our carry output comes into our clock input here of our BCD. It counts from 0 to 9, and it displays from 0 to 9 on there. No problems at all. So we can get, you know, our, our thing going from 0 uh, to 9 here, not a problem whatsoever, okay? But what we have to do is have some additional circuitry over here that actually starts to detect when we're actually transitioning over at the end of the count here. So what I've got, you'll notice that, well, I've got a big diode OR gate here. There's actually five diodes. There's four. I've tapped off all four BCD outputs. Okay, this is an OR gate as opposed to an AND gate we saw before, and it's going into the transistor here, and that's basically one big OR gate. Right, the five input OR gate. One comes from this chip over here, and four come from the BCD lines. Okay, so what we're going to do here is the Q4 output, okay, which corresponds in uh, binary, of course, BCD, it corresponds to eight. So when it gets to eight here, this is why in the sequence here, this thing counts up normally until it gets to eight, and then Q4 line here goes high, okay, and we're tapping that off here, don't worry about the OR thing at the moment, tapping off here, and that goes into the clock pulse of this 4518 is actually a dual BCD counter, so I'm actually using, it's the same chip, but there's two per chip, um, and it's got both a negative clock input and a positive going clock input, so you can choose whether or not you want to trigger from the negative going edge or from the positive going edge, it's quite handy, you know, you don't have to uh, put an inverter on the um, on the input for the thing. So we're going to actually, you'll notice that I've got the positive going one connected to ground because we don't want to use that. So we've got another BCD counter here that will start counting when the clock pulse goes low, okay? But we've transitioned Q4, when it counts up to eight, that line goes high. So we're not clocking this thing yet, okay? Just assume it's all still reset. It'll only clock when it goes low. So in effect, you could say that we've kind of like armed this uh, second BCD counter here. Probably not the right term, but I don't know. Oh, yeah, oh, that sounds okay. Now, nothing happens when it counts up to nine. Everything's still, when this one counts up to nine, everything's still fine, okay? But when it actually goes to zero, okay, then uh, this Q4 output drops back down to zero. Bingo, we've just fed a clock pulse into our second BCD counter here. And what happens when we get a clock pulse on here? Well, it counts up one. And the Q1 output here, so I'll call it Q1B, so it's not confused with this one output here. And I've got in the notes here, Q4 goes low, okay? This thing goes low, it clocks this 4518, and it starts counting up. So it counts to one. And then this Q1B output, of course, goes high, 
which is one, and then it gives a one zero on the display. Remember, this chip is reset, so we're gonna get a zero up here, but we want, when we're counting up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we want it in nine, we want it to actually now display 10. It's 10 o'clock. So the output here goes up. We've got another diode OR gate up here, and that switches on this digit here. So bingo, we've counted up to 10, and we've displayed 10 on both digits here. With me so far? So hopefully everything's reasonably clear at this point. Our, display, our clock has counted uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10, 1, 0. Okay, so we've got 1, 0 on the display. This chip keeps counting because it's kept being fed by the clock, and it'll start from 0 again. It'll count up to 1, okay? So we'll, it'll, be, it'll go from 10, 10 o'clock, 1, 0, to 11 o'clock, 1, 1. And that's all fine up until this point. But here's where some of the magic happens when we actually go to 12 o'clock. Check it out. We've actually tapped off Q2 output here, which is a 2, okay? So when this line goes high, we've got a diode AND gate in here for the reset of this chip. But it will only reset when both we're at count 2 here, Q2 is high, and also when we've armed this second BCD counter, see? Because we're tapping off the output here, as well as going up here and displaying our 1, we're also tapping off here and going down and going, aha, we've got a 1 here now, so we sit there, we're at uh, the point where we're 8, we go up to 9, 10, 1, and then we're waiting for it to come to the 2, and when it comes to the 2 for 12 o'clock, bingo, our chip resets, and this goes back to zero. Well, in fact, both of these chips go back to zero, because we want to count up to 12, remember? So our count resets. So that's why these two reset lines are tied like this. So both chips reset. We're back to exactly where we were before. But I know what you're thinking. Dave, we don't want to... We actually want to display 12 up here. We don't want it to go back to zero. Okay, the output of here has gone back to zero. That's no good to us. What, what good is that? Well, this is where this diode or gate comes in here. You'll notice, that once again, how we tapped off our 12 here, this same line went through a diode. I, actually, I didn't tell you to ignore that diode before, but you should have. So this sneaky little thing here, what it's doing is forcing a basically a 2 into there, okay? The, the output counter of this is 0. Remember, it's reset itself back to 0. This and this is all reset back to 0. So it should display a zero up here, but we're actually forcing this diode OR line here, and this is where this diode OR gate comes into it as well. The combination of these two OR gates are going to force a 12 display up here when we've actually got zero in this counter here, because we don't want to display zero at that point. So if we've got a zero, 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 zero on the output here, because this chip has just reset itself, this diode OR gate is going to have a, oops, I made a small error in this thing. This is actually a NOR, <laughs> let that come through. This is actually a diode uh, NOR gate. So if we've got a zero, 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 zero here, because our chip is reset, okay, then we're actually going to get a one out of here due to this pull-up resistor because all these diodes and this chip is reset too so all these diodes come in here and all five inputs are zero we're going to get a one out of here because this transistor's turned off and we've got a pull-up bingo if we're going to pull up here this is going to turn this diode on and force a one into the input of this uh, BCD to seven segment disc decoder so even though this counter here is at zero we're forcing our seven segment disc de decoder to display two beauty but we don't want zero two we want 12 so once again the output of this nor gate here goes up here and actually forces once again it's an or gate here so it forces our one here so even though all of our circuitry down here is reset we've got zero and zero we're actually forcing tricking this thing into displaying 12. ah sneaky so in our countdown here our BCD counter is actually zero, okay? It's actually zero at this point, but we're displaying our 12, and that's how, and then the BCD counter starts, is at zero, so we can start counting one, two, three, and it can start that sequence again. It's that tricky point there 
that we have to force a display to 12. But otherwise, the BCD counter doesn't know the difference. And then, as I said right back at the start, we've just got a uh, flip-flop over here, 4013, which is just connected down to the reset line down here. So it toggles every uh, 12 hours and then just toggles between A, display in A and P, just by turning this segment here on or off. As you can see, it displays an A if that's on or a P if that's off. Simple. Goodness, how long has this video been going for? Oh, well over half an hour. Sorry about that. Maybe 40 minutes or something. 45? I don't know. Crazy. But anyway, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that look at uh, an old school 4000 series CMOS uh, digital clock. And it works really well. As I said, it's been working for decades and decades since the late 80s this thing apart from some brief downtime where I ripped the bloody chips out but I put them back in and uh, got the thing going again and it's worked a treat it ne almost never missed a beat as long as your mains is uh, good you know you don't get constant main disruption and uh, uh, things like that just doing the 50 hertz is um is really very good it was probably the most accurate clock I ever had in my house because over the long term that 50 hertz it's pretty darn close to bang on so there you go. I hope you enjoyed that little look at designing a CMOS clock. If you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up and all that jazz and uh, discuss it on the, in the comments or at the EV blog forum, wherever you want to do it. Catch you next time.